Here's a fun fact about Daz. I really hate the pressure that he's put on the potential number one picks months before the draft. And after what I've heard about Nick Dacos in the last couple of days, I feel like that's been vindicated a hell of a lot. Let's have a chat. Now, personally, I would hate to be a number one pick in the AFL. The amount of scrutiny and stress that you put through straight off the bat is completely unfair. And you only need to look at the mental state of Tom Boyd to know that this can have an effect on you. Now, sure, Luke Hodge and Nick Rewalt from years gone by have been fantastic. Adam Cooney won a Brownlow. Brendan Goddard was a very good player. And you look at modern days, Sam Walsh looks a goer. If Matt Rowe's injury-free, he could be anything. Andy McGrath took huge steps forward this year. But being the number one draft pick brings about a pressure during this stage of the season unlike anything we've seen. Nick Dacos and Jason Horn francis are sharing all of the spotlight in this draft, whereas other high draft picks, in the projections that is, Mac Andrew, Finn Callahan, Josh Ward, Josh Gibkiss, good year to be a Josh, aren't getting any sort of the same spotlight. Now, whilst the coaches of Dacos and Horn francis are saying these kids can deal with the pressure, there's two things that need to be noted there. Number one, there shouldn't be that level of pressure there in the first place because Nick Dacos needs to be the best version of Nick Dacos that he can, regardless of what Collingwood have had to give up to get him because it wasn't his fault Collingwood's list management was in the shitter. It is also not up to Jason Horn francis to be the next version of Patrick Dangerfield and Nat Fife, who don't forget have won three Brownlow medals and this young man has not played a game of AFL football yet, because North Melbourne are down the bottom of the ladder. It is not up to these boys to be the messiahs. They need to be the best version of themselves. It's that simple. But I want to focus on Dacos just for a tick. Collingwood's off-season, especially last year, was put under so much scrutiny when they got rid of Adam Trelaw, Jaden Stevenson, uh, and I'm missing one, Tom Phillips, uh, and they got rid of Atu Bosunovalagi as well. But it's fair to say that he wasn't as high profile as those three players. Now, Tom Phillips played every game at Hawthorne and was fine. Jaden Stevenson had some really good games. I look at the Carlton and the West Coast games for reference there. And Adam Trelaw, although he played in the grand final, was a little bit inconsistent at times. Sure, Collingwood did lose some quality and they're down the bottom this year. But it's their drafting that really screwed them because they had nine debutants last year without any rising stars. And it's not like they took really good picks in the last year's draft. And they're not taking good picks into this one because all they're getting is Dacos. Now, I really feel for Nick here because he's going to be expected, make no bars about it, when it comes to Collingwood fans and the media, he's going to be expected to be the best player in the competition this year. And for anyone thinking that that's insane, look at the comparisons that's already being made and the comments already being made about him. Nick is expected to lead the Collingwood Football Club one day, if you listen to former Pi Tark and Lockyer. He's expected to take all this pressure on the chin, regardless of the fact that he hasn't played a game in Victoria for months, hasn't played an AFL game yet, if you listen to Trade Radio. Even Matt Randell, who is quickly becoming the Skip Bayless of AFL trade period, is struggling to contain his excitement. Now, even if Nick Dacos does become the number one player in the competition, when was the last time a number one pick was the best player in the competition? Really think about it. Now, you could definitely argue that Nick Rewalt was one of the best players in the competition in 2009, and I wouldn't begrudge that. Nick was a superstar, but that's one. Luke Hodge, as much as I love him, was never the best player in the competition. Never. He was the best player in the competition on Grand Final Day twice and has an impeccable finals record that sees him in the upper echelon of Mr. September's. But who else? Sam Walsh came fourth in the Brownlow, and by this time next year, 12 months from when I'm recording this, he could be the best player in the competition. So let's put him in that bracket just for a second. That's two. We've had number one draft picks since 1987. That's 35 coming into this year. Three. Two that you could argue could be the best in the competition with Rewalt in 09 and Walsh next year. One with Hodges' impeccable record. And that's it. That's it. Every other time there was a best player in the competition, they weren't a number one pick. Add in on top of this, something else that isn't Nick's fault is all the fans' mockery of the fact that he is going to be Mia Favola's next boyfriend because that's just how morons work and that's all that's important to them is Mia Favola's dating life for reasons I'll never understand. She can date whoever she wants, as far as I'm concerned. And let's face it, her last boyfriend was a number one pick, so it's not like she can do better in the draft that way. 
Poor Nick just needs to be able to play footy and play footy the best that he can. Collingwood are going to get Pat Lipinski, which means their midfield is going to be Pendlebury, Adams, Lipinski, side bottom will probably play more of an outside role. And they've got some decent outside players at the pies, but is Nick a part of that center square? Does he start on a half forward flank, much like Horn Francis did for South Adelaide this year or North Adelaide, whichever Adelaide it was, I apologize. Where is he going to start? What kind of year are we expecting him to have? If he doesn't win the rising star, is he a bust? Of course not. The media is going to tell you he is. And I wonder if Kane Corns is going to do what he did with Connor Rosie and Sam Walsh and go way too quickly on Dacos being a bust, especially if he has kind of a quiet debut. We can't really judge Nick Dacos' quality until at least a full season, maybe 30 games. Don't forget that there wasn't just Kane Corns who said Connor Rosie was a better pick. Don't forget that. It just so happens that Kane is the loudest, the most obnoxious, and I will give him credit for this, the only one that admitted he was wrong. Nick needs to be left alone, in my opinion. Jason Horn Francis needs to be left alone. Let these kids be drafted, number one. Then, let them work their ass off in the preseason. I'm more than happy for you to speculate, but putting this shit on kids, especially in a social media daylight, no wonder we have more mental health problems in the AFL than we probably ever have. Twitter is a violent place, and morons such as me, in the sense of casual fans, I will definitely not be doing this, are going to get pissed, get on Twitter, get on Facebook, blast these kids if they have a poor game, like they aren't 35 years old, didn't get past Rezies in the under-19s and think that they have a clue. That is already going to happen, and that's going to happen to most draft picks, let alone the only two that are really being talked about. I do feel for Nick. And I'm in his corner. And I'm in Jason Horn Francis' corner too here. These two are going to have to deal with more pressure than anyone else in the competition next year. And these poor bastards haven't even been drafted yet. Leave them alone. Let them develop. Let them play footy. And if they're going to turn into superstars, let it happen. Enjoy the ride. Click subscribe if you like the content. Drop a like. That would be really great for the algorithms. And come have an intelligent conversation. Let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree. More videos will be coming out over the off-season. Take care. Be safe. Be well.